Good morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Brabham. I want to welcome you to our our uh, Christmas call-in on, on this morning, this Christmas. Uh, we, we certainly um, uh, wanted to see you guys in person, but and with the condition of the um, of the parking lot, I didn't want to take a chance of getting someone um, injured. Um, I want to go ahead and mute the phones um, at this time. Uh, we won't be um, too long, but I want, want you to get your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 2. Um, uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, before I mute the phones, is there anyone with any, uh, any announcements um, before we get started? Any announcements? I, I do want to let you know that this will be available as soon as uh, we get finished. If uh, you desire to um, get an MP3 copy of this message, uh, just text me at 8, and I will get you a copy as soon as it becomes available. Go ahead and mute the phones if nobody has anything. All right. Um, just going to continue with the announcement. We will have a devotional call on Tuesday um, at 6.15, so keep that in mind. Uh, we'll give you some further instructions about um, watch night service that's going to take place on next Saturday night at uh, 10.22. Uh, we also want you to um, keep everybody uh, in, in prayer during this season. Um, I mean, it's been a... Um, just in some very cold weather that we have um, had. As a matter of fact, Arctic, I don't think it has been this cold in over 30 years. Um, we certainly um, are grateful for, um, you know, uh, Brother Michael Pearson and some of the other ones that have went out and delivered, you know, some fruit baskets to our, our seniors. Um, you should have gotten um, those uh, seniors, and we certainly appreciate uh um, you all, and, uh, and we love you all, and, uh, and hopefully you enjoy your fruit. Um, let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this is a day that you made, and as the psalmist say, we shall um, rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you right now, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, even though it's not in person as we desire, but we're thankful right now for technology that we're able to uh, come together and still be able to get your word to go forward. We thank you right now in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Let us look at our scripture um, that we're going to read um, on today. We're going to read only one verse, but I do want you to keep your uh, Bible um, open. And I want to read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible says this. It says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Um, verse number seven, um, it says that she laid him in a manger. I, I want to just speak very brief, briefly from the subject, a message from the manger. That's what we're going to talk about, the message from the manger. There are four different gospels, and three of the gospels are what we call the synoptic gospels. And you have one that's called the non-synoptic gospel. The three synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the one non-synoptic gospel is the gospel of John. Each of these four writers had a different purpose in writing their narrative and the story of Jesus. And when you look at the four gospels, you're not looking at four exact stories, but you're looking at four similar stories, which each having a purpose for being written. When you look at Matthew and Luke, they are only... Uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, two gospels that give the birth, uh, give us a birth narrative of Jesus, and that's Matthew and Luke. You will not find a birth narrative in Mark, and neither will you. Uh, uh, you you'll find a 
we have the modified birth narrative of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Let me say that again. Um, Matthew and Luke gives us a birth narrative of Jesus. Mark does not give us a birth narrative, and there's a modified birth narrative in the Gospel of John. It's interesting because each of these gospel writers have a different purpose in their writing. When you look at the Gospel of Matthew, you discover that one of Matthew's purposes for writing was to speak about Jesus' ancestry. Uh, that, that's important, that Mark wrote about ancestry. That's why when you open up Matthew, you see this list of names that none of us can uh, enunciate properly because Matthew was trying to connect Jesus to his Jewish heritage. Mark was the first gospel that was written, but when they lined up the New Testament, they placed Matthew first because the first chapter of Matthew served as a bridge to connect the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we understand that Jesus has a connection to both David and Abraham. It's significant that he's connected to David because, like David, Jesus would also be king. The only difference is that we would not just, he would just not just be a king, but he's king of kings. It's significant that he's connected to Abraham because Abraham had um, the promises. Abraham had the covenants. Abraham had the blessings on his life through Jesus that he would be what the psalm writers say, the seed of Abraham. So in Matthew, we learn about the ancestry of Jesus, but in Mark's gospel, we learn about the humanity of Jesus. Mark gospel is the first gospel and the shortest gospel. It has no information about Jesus' immaculate birth. Mark does not have much about what happens after his resurrection because Mark's goal is to depict Jesus as a human man. Mark, Mark points to uh, out that it was not significant to him that Jesus was born without an earthly father, that he was placed in a special womb set aside in Mary. That was not important to Mark because Mark wanted to portray Jesus as a regular man being used by God, and he did not have a lot of time to do it. Throughout uh, Mark, you read words like straightway, words like immediately, words like swiftly, words like den, and words like next, all because Mark was trying to let us know that Jesus was human. It, it, it's good to know that Jesus was human because uh, we are human, and the writer of Hebrews caught on to this. In Hebrews 4 and 15, he says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but with at all points tempted likewise as, as we are, yet without sin. Uh, aren't you glad that you and I have a Savior that knows what it's like to be lied on, that uh, we have a Savior that knows what it's like to have your sibling turn their back on you. Um, my brothers and sisters, you got a Jesus who knows what it's like to walk with somebody for three years, and during the third year, they reveal that they never, that they was never ride or die with you in the first place. My brothers and sisters, uh, you know, uh, Jesus teaches us that my brothers and sisters that um, that you know we can be with trifling people, <laughs> and, and 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 we know how. Um, it feels because that's what happened with Jesus. So you get the humanity in Mark, you get ancestry in Matthew, but in the Gospel of Luke, uh, my brothers and sisters, you get uh, inclusivity, inclusivity because it, it is Luke that the Gentiles are included. Matthew suggests that Jesus came for those in the house of Israel or, or, or Jewish people. Luke said, no, God is too big to be little. And Jesus has too much to be narrow uh, to come to one community. He did not come for just the Jews, but for the Gentiles. And you ought to give God some praise this morning on Christmas because if you're not a Jew, then you are a Gentile. And Luke lets us know that Jesus came to include the people who were marginalized and excluded from society. As a matter of fact, in Matthew's gospel, the birth of Jesus included more, more Joseph than Mary. But, but Luke has more about Mary than Joseph. I like that because Luke is radical because in that day, women were not considered to be equal. And I came to let you know that Jesus is an equal opportunist. Jesus wants everybody to know uh, that, you, that we all are on the same playing field. Don't matter where you live. Don't matter if you have a Ph.D. or no degree. Don't matter if you are a woman or a man. Don't matter if you graduated cum laude or summa cum laude or thank you, Lordy. It doesn't matter, you know, because uh, Jesus, you know, uh, came to include everyone. So Matthew deals with ancestry, 
Um, Mark deals with humanity. Luke deals with in- inclusivity. But John takes it a step forward, my brothers and sisters, and that's why John is a non synoptic gospel because John is on a whole different wavelength. John is a whole different sphere by himself. John is in a whole other dimension. John skips the birth of Jesus like Matthew and Luke. He does not deal with the ministry of Jesus like Mark. John says that Jesus was so off the chain that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word means, that word, word literally means logos. God literally sent logos into chaos to create cosmos. God, John literally reinterprets the book of Genesis and says that Jesus did not just show up in a womb, but before Mary was even created, Jesus helped create his mother. He's in the, he is the only son who anonymously helped create his mother and made it comfortable enough because he knew he would have to come through it. Jesus is, and John is divine. That's why he can turn water into wine. That's why he can take two tilapia and five red lobster biscuits and turn it into a banquet. He can show up at a pool and find a man who had been there for 38 years and ask him, what do you want to be made whole? And by the time Jesus leaves, the man gets up and carrying um, what, what, carry what has been carrying him. And when you deal with John, John is dealing with the divinity of Jesus. But if, if you take the notes, you know, Luke deals with inclusivity, uh, Matthew deals with ancestry, Mark deals with humanity, but John deals with divinity. And here's what I like. Um, although all four of the gospel writers had different purposes and points, Matthew dealing with ancestry, Mark dealing with humanity, Luke dealing with inclusivity, and John dealing with divinity. What I like about all four Gospels is that Jesus showed up. <laughs> how, how, how he gets there is irrelevant to me. To me, it's, it does not matter if, if I like John um, said that he was, he was here in the beginning. Uh, it, it means that he's, uh, he's, he's homoousio, which means that he's the same substance as of God. Uh, I'm okay with John. If he came through Mary in the book of Matthew and Joel had to protect him, I'm cool with that. If he had to come, had to be hidden in Egypt, I'm cool with that. Mark, you know, if uh, if you if you don't want to talk about his birth and talk about his ministry, I, I'm cool with that. Luke, if you don't want to talk about Mary and how God favored a girl from the get, I'm fine with all that. It ain't about how he got here. He, he, he may get here in different ways for different people, but long as he shows up. And Jesus has not come to all of us the same way. Some of us didn't meet Jesus in the church. We met him at the club. You went to the club with the intentions of, 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 of backing it up and, and dropping it like it's hot. In the middle of all that dancing, in the middle of all that drinking, you got an epiphany that you need to come to church the next Sunday morning because you realize that drugs can't give you peace, that drinking can't drown your sorrows. And I don't care how good you can, you, you can dance, you know, you can't dance your troubles away. And some of us met God in some low places, but aren't you glad that you met him and he turned your life around? And that's the whole message of Christmas is that God came. God has stepped out of eternity and into time. God breaks into history. God is about to flip the world upside down when he shows up in all his glory and all his majesty and all his sovereignty. He does not show up being born in a palace. Uh, he, he goes on the backside of Jerusalem, and God in flesh is laid in a manger. How, how is that that the sovereign uh, sovereign one becomes skin, that divinity becomes dust, the Father becomes flesh, greatness of eternity down to the troubles of temporary, uh, of tra- tra- down the troubles of temporality. How, how, great, how good is God that he steps into the world and is not born in Lebanon's Children's Hospital? How is it that he does not go, my brothers and sisters, you know, to Jackson General? He doesn't go to urgent care. He, 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 he goes to a barn. He was laid in Major. How is it that your Savior and my Savior spent his first hours in the world, not in a crystal crib, but in a feeding trough? His next door neighbor was donkeys and pigs. He was laid in a manger. Uh, I, I, three times in, 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 the, in, the, in the first 20 verses of, of Luke chapter 2, in verse 7, verse 12, verse 16, you'll find the word manger. A manger. Manger is a, a stall. It's a, it, it's a place where cattle were 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 fed. 
my brothers and sisters, you know, that's that's the message of uh, of of of, of, uh, of of Christmas is that Jesus was laid in a manger three times in and and the text is verse seven, verse twelve, and verse sixteen. You'll find that word manger, and it literally means a uh, feeding trough. And my brothers and sisters, you know, while on this Christmas morning, if you don't mind listening um, to what the manger has to say, you know, I preached all types of sermons um, concerning the birth of Jesus. I preached it from Mary's perspective. Uh, I preached, you know, a message, you know, a couple of years ago, have a have a Merry Christmas. Uh, I preached um, last week about Christmas from Joseph's perspective. I preached about the wise men. But, but, but today I want to just preach, you know, about this manger. Do you mind listening to what this manger has to say this morning, and we'll let you go. I just got a few points, and we're done. If the manger could talk, uh, it would tell us, first of all, that God is coming to shelter us. That, that's the first point, you know, that the manger says that um, God is coming to shelter us because the Bible says that there was no room for them in the inn. There was no space for them in the hotels or hospitals. Jesus was about to be born, and Joseph and Mary are asking because uh, they're about to bring God's son into the world. Everybody told them we have no room. All of the vacancies are occupied in the hotel, and we have no room. All the doctors are busy at all the hospitals. There's no more room. So the first lesson that the manger is teaching us is that God is coming to shelter us because when, when Jesus is rejected as a baby, it's a depiction of what would happen for him the rest of his life. People who could have made room for him refused to make room for him, and he had to go outside in order to be born. I, I don't know whether you are sleeping or you didn't eat breakfast yet, your Savior before uh, he could even speak was rejected. <laughs> before he could write his name, before he even knew his name, he was rejected at the beginning of his life. But God provided another alternative. It might not have been what they wanted, but God did provide something. And God made sure that even when people rejected him, that he would be warm and he would be safe. Let me help you on Christmas morning. You are walking around here with your head down because somebody rejected you. Um, some school you applied for, um, they didn't want to let you in. Some job you wanted, you didn't get. Some boo you wanted, they, they didn't want you. Uh, you thought they wanted you. They just, they just <laughs> my brothers and sisters, they just wanted something from you, but they didn't want you. Now you're broken because you let them, uh, my brothers and sisters, you wanted them and they didn't want you. And now you tore up from the floor up. Uh, you won't do your hair. You, you won't get your nails done. You know, uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, you, 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 you're singing that song by the OJ's Christmas just ain't Christmas without the one you love. And New Year's just ain't New Year's without the one you love. My brothers and sisters, you need to set your, your sad self down because the word for you this morning is that when you're rejected in one place, God will provide for you in another place. It may not be what you want. But you want to thank God that God is giving you something. <laughs> I may be in a barn, but at least I'm safe. <laughs> uh, it may not be where I want to be, but at least I'm warm. You may not live where you want to live, but my brothers and sisters, somebody ought to give God praise um, that you guys had some lights this morning. You had heat. You had, had water. Somebody ought to give God praise because even when you are rejected, he made a way for you. So the first thing that the manger would teach us is that God will shelter us. But not only will God shelter us, my brothers and sisters, the manger lets us know that God is coming to school us. <laughs> yeah, he's coming to school us because the Bible says uh, he was laid in a manger. <laughs> and, and we don't even use that word manger in this country anymore. Huh? But those of us who live in agricultural societies uh, will say something like a feeding trough. We, we don't use words like manger, but 2,000 years later, we're still talking about a manger. This manger is mentioned only three times in the Bible, and I told you it was in verse 7, um, verse number 12 and verse number 16. My brothers and sisters, you know, uh, um, uh, but, 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 but every, uh, uh, around every Christmas, you can't even create a nativity scene without including a manger. You can't even talk about Jesus showing up in the world without talking about a manger. If, if we wanted to have a, a, a Christmas play and, and reenact the birth of Jesus, uh, we'll have to get Brother Melvin Guyton to build us a manger. <laughs> now, now it, it, it's not a popular item, but the reason we know about this manger is because who got in it. 
Well, we don't know uh, much about a manger other than Jesus got in a manger. <laughs> see, see, I'm just like the manger. I ain't special. I'm not significant. And the only reason you know my name is because Jesus is in me. <laughs> can, can, can somebody testify that you aren't all that in a bag of chips? You're not all of that. The people knew um uh, Knew, knew you when, um, when, when by your nickname, uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, people won't even sit by you. But the only reason why people know you is because Jesus has got inside of you. And when you let Jesus inside of you, people will be talking about you long after you're dead and gone. <laughs> I, I came to tell you, don't, don't try to get connected to people. Um, you, you, ain't got, you ain't got to pass out cards and you ain't got to pass out your number to be promoted. Just let Jesus inside you, and Jesus will provide for you if you just let Jesus in. My brothers and sisters, the manger would teach us that Jesus came to shelter us, that he came to school us. But my brothers and sisters, it also teaches us that, you know, Jesus is coming to show us a sign. When you look at my brothers and sisters, the text, it says that they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Verse number 12 says, and this shall be a sign unto you that you shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. So God is coming to show a sign to us. My brothers and sisters, here's why Luke was inclusive, because he does not, he does not, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, focus a wise man and magi like Matthew did. God sends a message to the shepherds. Watch this. Uh, he, he didn't go to the wise. He didn't go to the astronomers like uh, and the learned people like Matthew. The Bible tells us in verse number eight uh, through verse number twelve. It, it tells us, my brothers and sisters, that, that there came in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them. And by verse number 12, said, and this shall be a sign unto you, that you shall find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And when you go down to verse number 16, when the shepherds get there, and they came, the Bible said they came with, in, with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Here is my brothers and sisters. Uh, verse 7 said he's born and placed in a manger. Verses 9 through 12, the angel said, when you get there, you'll know you're there because you'll find him in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Verse 16 says they go looking for him, and they stop when they see a manger. He's born and placed in a manger. The angel said, look for a manger. They notice Jesus because he's in a manger. <laughs> Let me say that again. Uh, he, they, they, they look for Jesus, and they stop looking because they see Jesus in a manger. God will always hook it up so that you know that it's Jesus. <laughs> God will do something so radical that you'll know that it's Jesus, so that you will know that it's nobody here on earth but Jesus. Is there anybody um, that this year you have some opportunities come this year, and you know that it was nobody but Jesus? Can somebody um, think of all the stuff that you've been through, and in this last Sunday of 2022, you're still in your right mind because it was nobody but Jesus. You still got your joy. Stuff around you may be crazy, uh, but guess what, my brothers and sisters? It's Jesus, and you need to give God praise, you know, because you was able to look into the hills which come with your help, and all your help comes from, from the Lord. Well, I normally, I normally give you three points, but since it's Christmas, I'm going to give you a bonus. Uh, the main teaches us that God is coming to shelter us. God is coming to school us. God is coming to show us a sign. But fourthly, my brothers and sisters, when you look at verse number seven, um, the Bible says that God is coming to sustain us. <laughs> oh, you, 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 you're about to be sustained because God has come. Uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 you need to tell somebody that's sitting with you this morning that I'm about to be sustained. I, I know my brothers and sisters, uh, uh, you can't shout right now because you don't know what I'm talking about. But the Bible says that they put him in a feeding trough. My brothers and sisters, uh, manger was what you put food in. <laughs> and I talked with this manger uh, last night, and the manger told me that I got confused when it put a baby inside of me. Because up until that point, I only carried food. Why would they place a baby in a place where you put food? The manger said that it was years later 
that word went out <laughs> that the that the baby I was carrying, he took two pieces of tilapia and five pieces of bread and turned it into a banquet meal. But that's not the that's part of the story. This manger is, is still talking. He says, John chapter six, John tells us that the crowd came back and my brothers and sisters and and give us more bread. But Jesus looked at them and told them that they were that they were looking at the wrong self. You want bread for your flesh, but Jesus said, "I am the bread of life." But when they put Jesus in the manger as a baby, it was prophecy that he would be bread when you're hungry. He would be water when you're thirsty. If he get in you, he'll sustain you. And when Jesus get in you, you'll lose that taste for alcohol. When Jesus get in, in you, you'll lose that taste for cigarettes. When Jesus get in you, you'll lose that taste for, for weed. When you, he get in you, you'll lose that taste for drugs because when you're filled with bread, that's why when you're filled with bread, when you're filled with Jesus, you can walk in the sanctuary and you'll shout because you're already filled with bread. When I woke up this morning, I may not have had a biscuit. I may not have had a bowl of oatmeal. I may not have had some sausage. I may not have had some eggs, but I have Jesus, and he filled me up. And somebody ought to celebrate because every time uh, uh, you got low, he filled you up. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to quit. You know, we've been going at it for 30 minutes. Let's, let's, let's go for about 10 more. Uh, uh, God is, the major said God is coming to shelter us. He's coming to school us. He's coming to show a sign to us. He's coming to sustain us. But last but not least, the manger says that God is coming to save us. Uh, that, that, that's why my brothers and sisters, that Paul said in Philippians, uh, he said, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, who made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus was content in a manger when he was born so that we could be content in a mansion when we die. I, I better say that again. Jesus was content in a manger when he was born so that you and I could be content in a mansion when we die. I got to go, but I asked this manger one more question. How are you made? <laughs> he said, some people make me out of carved stone. Some people will make me out of metal. But because where I was in this region and in this town, they didn't have all those precious resources. He said that they use wood and they use nails to make me. <laughs> so he was born and shows up, and they place him in wood and nails. And if you want to walk by and view him as a baby, you'll get a glimpse of what Jesus was going to do 33, 33 years later. <laughs> I, I got to close you this morning. Merry Christmas. But the manger was just one step on the way to Calvary. The Calvary Road is downhill, my brothers and sisters, not because it gets easier, but because it gets lower. The Savior life starts low and it ends even lower. And that's what Philippians chapter 2 says, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus, uh, though he was in the form of God, that he counted himself not equal with God, and he humbled himself to come down and die on the cross. And this is how Jesus saves my brothers and sisters. This is how the Messiah fulfills all the promises. This is how the Lord reigns from infinite um, deity to a feeding trough to the final torments on the cross. Merry Christmas, my brothers and sisters, but his birth depicted his death. Because on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. It was the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old rugged cross where the dearest and the best of the world uh, for lost sinners were slain. Can I tell you how to make crosses? In order to make a cross, you've got to have some wood and some nails. And when he was born, he was placed in the midst of wood and nails. And I believe that Jesus handled the cross because he had already handled his crib.
He, he said on the cross that this looks familiar <laughs> because when I was a baby, they laid me on wood and nails. And when, and when they started hanging me on the cross, everything they were using, my brothers and sisters, Jesus said, I already seen that before because not only was he born in a manger, but his daddy was a carpenter and he worked with wood and he worked with nails. <laughs> and later on in my life, Jesus was preaching a boat. And he slept in a boat. And, and that boat was, guess what, made out of wood and nails. So when Jesus got the cavalry, it was no big thing to him because he was able to say, because I'm, I'm already familiar with wood and nails, that it's finished because I can handle wood and nails. And my brothers and sisters, some of y'all have, have not got the point. But Jesus came just so that you and I could be saved. You can keep your Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Just give me Jesus. You can have your Frosty the Snowman, but just give me Jesus. You can have your chestnut roasting over an open fire, but just give me Jesus. You can have your Christmas tree, your wreath, and, and your lights on your hedge bushes, and, and your stockings by your fireplace, but just give me Jesus. And when I woke up this morning, just as long as I got Jesus, my brothers and sisters, I don't got to have a whole lot. I ain't got to have a Christmas gift. But long as I got Jesus, my brothers and sisters, when you got Jesus, you got a way out of no way. When you got Jesus, you got bread when you're hungry. When you got Jesus, you got the rose of Shan. When you got Jesus, you got the lily of the valley. When you got Jesus, you got bridge over troubled water. You got a heart fix in the mind regulator. You got Matthew's king. You got Mark's suffering servant. You got Luke's great physician. You got John soon coming king. You got Paul's name changer. You got Peter's life rearranger. When you got Jesus, you got a Abraham's ram in the bush. You got Noah's ark. You got David's shepherd. You got Solomon's wisdom. You got Nehemiah's architect. You got Jeremiah's Kleenex. You got Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of the wheel. You got a bill payer. You got a company care, keeper. Is there anybody you're on Christmas morning excited and thank God that you got Jesus? And if you got Jesus, you got the best that God has to offer. I'm going to leave you with a, with, with, with a story. Uh, I, I'm reminded of a story of a little girl who came home after church. She was lifting up her mattress. She was looking in her closet. She was looking in all the cabinets in the kitchen. And her daddy walked in the kitchen, and she said, Daddy, have you seen Andy? Daddy said, who is Andy? And, and, and she ran upstairs and asked her mother, have you seen Andy? And the mother said, who is Andy? She, she ran across the, the hall to her oldest brother room and said, Brother, have you seen Andy? And by this time, the mother and the father ran up to the room and said, we're scared about you because you're running through the house asking about Andy. Who in the world is Andy? And she, she said, none of y'all was paying attention in church because after the preacher got finished preaching, he said, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I'm his own. She said, I want to know who Andy is. And, and the daddy started laughing and said, I, I can tell you that his name is not Andy, but his name is Jesus, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. My brothers and sisters, you know, aren't you glad about the Andy in your life, and he walks with me, and he pays your bill, and he will change your life, and he will lift you up, and he will dry your tears, and he will open your doors, and he will give you blessings, and he will change your life. I, I hope you know. Andy on this morning, because whatever betides you, God will take care of you. My brothers and sisters, I thank you for your, your, your time on this morning. I thank you for, uh, you know, tuning in. I, I, I wish we could have uh, been together. Uh, we will give out some scholarships on the 8th of, uh, of, of January, you know, to our people. Uh, to our, 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 our college, college people, but my brothers and sisters, every time you, you see this manger, I want you to remember something, that Jesus know how to handle wood and nails. My brothers and sisters, Jesus came to save. He came to die in our place. My brothers and sisters, he came to take our sins and give us his righteousness. He came to take our death and give us his life. He came to take our guilt and give us his grace. He came to take our judgment 
and he died on the cross. Listen, when you think about Christmas, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had had been to be more pleased, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was salvation, so God sent us a redeemer. My brothers and sisters, Matthew 121 says, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I thank you for your time. I'm out of time. But our, our, our point of the day is this, that the manger, if the manger could speak to us, it would tell us that God is coming to shelter us, that God is coming to school us, God is coming to show us a sign, God is coming to sustain us, and last but not least, God is coming to save us. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you right now, Lord, for your word on this morning. Father God, bless your people. Father God, you know, um, as we uh, deal with this season, Lord, keep us safe, Lord. We pray right now, Lord, for divine protection. We ask right now, Lord, that you hide us behind your cross and that you cover us with your blood. We're thankful right now, Lord, that the manger teach us that you know how to handle wood and nails. We just praise you right now. Thank you right now for your word. And, Father God, as we depart, you know, this uh, teaching session, but never your presence, in Jesus' name, and the people of God say amen. God bless you. God keep you. If you desire to share this devotional message, uh, just send me a text message at 7. We'll get it to you as soon as it becomes available. God bless you. God keep you. And we'll talk at you later. Bye-bye.